So, uh, I, in, this, in the spirit of uh, our day today, I, I have only three slides, but I have 10 uh, conflict and biases slides as a preface. Uh, and part of this is because of my inter interest uh, in the history of science and medicine, and I wanted to set a little bit of context uh, and go over a few things that haven't been mentioned today. And these are uh, some of the projects and organizations which I work for or I founded um, and continue to do work on. And so, yeah, so a few salient biases and background. Uh, I, I am in the camp of being more excited uh, than terrified uh, of DNA sequencing technologies. So you can count me in that camp. And I think that it really, that this is a te technology that is the modern day X-ray vision glasses. Um, and it, just to review a little bit of history, there's sort of one model of DNA sequencing uh, adoption out there by citizen scientists, which has trickled down, which, you know, it's driven by this chart, which you've seen all over the place of the, the rapid declining cost uh, of DNA sequencing. Um, but DNA sequencing started in elite labs only. You know, only this is the Whitehead Institute at MIT. Uh, and, you know, not too long ago, 10 years ago, if this was about the only way you could get access to DNA sequencing technologies. But boy, is that changing. Uh, DNA sequencing devices have iPod docs or iPad docs, iPhone docs. Uh, they're getting small and portable and usable and disposable, low cost. Um, and there's this whole other thread that's happening out there that's been mentioned just a little bit with uh, do-it-yourself biology and the, and the biohacking community. And we might call that trickle-up innovation. Um, so this is a data point. The 2013 UK Young Engineer of the Year Award has a PCR device in his basement. Um, so this is the actual sort of adoption of these technologies in the wild. Uh, and, and the rate at which this is happening has been really dramatic with not just PCR devices, but the whole sort of biotechnology tool chain and low cost laboratory devices. Um, and so here's one just from a few weeks ago that raised over $200,000 on Kickstarter for quantified uh, QPCR, um, and there also are communities associated with these technologies. There are communities of practice out there, and one of the things that I do is to build communities of practice around new technologies. And to start on the data side, this is one in Boston called Hack Reduce, and that um, for those who don't have the institutional resources uh, of Google and the ability to actually uh, get uh, you know, crunch and process big data, you can now go like a gym membership uh, and uh, pay a fee and get access to big data computing power at places like Hack Reduce. Um, or on the biotechnology side, you can go get access to advanced biotechnology uh, classes, hands-on training, run your own experiments at community labs like GenSpace or BioCurious in the Bay Area. GenSpace is in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and so I've been part of this community for a long time. And I'm a founder of DOI Bio, and, and then this sort of one of the things that I work on is this Ask a Bio Safety Expert, which is, touches on our conversations about IRBs in some sense and equitable access to oversight. And so here's a model maybe you could apply to uh, human subjects research or some version of this where there are actually professional biosafety uh, experts who typically are attached to an institution and they only care about sort of the perimeter of the institution and biosafety happening there, but they are the experts in the world. And they are providing sort of free biosafety services to the biohacking community through a, a more or less a biohacker hotline. Um, and so this is very much still in the prototyping stage, uh, and we're going V2 on it uh, this year, what worked, what didn't. Uh, anyways, I spent most of my time, this is my biases, uh, since uh, 2007, working on the Personal Genome Project, and I've set these up now in four countries, uh, and a bunch more are underway. Um, and there are, it's sort of a unique set of features, uh, not any one feature is necessarily unique, but taken together, um, our global network of research studies and participants and scientists, uh, uh, I think, create something very special. Um, so now for my actual three slides. Um, I really, you know, recognizing that it's the end of the day, I felt like it would be worthwhile just to sort of pick one thing and focus on it. Uh, and the one thing that I would like to focus on is this concept of equal access. And I don't think it's ever been defined. Um, uh, but it should be, so here's an attempt at it. And this is, I think, a style of governance uh, which is out there, which is where the research study sort of, <laughs> I, there was an amazing quote, I can't believe I'd never heard this before, which was, uh, I'm trying to remember how it goes, nothing about me without me. 
Uh, I'd never heard that before. This is based. Really, it is incredible. Um, ah, okay, got it. So equal access is essentially that. Uh, in short, it's sharing by default, and that, um, and uh, and this is something which I think holds tremendous. Pro tremendous promise and is absolutely a necessary prerequisite for doing actual civilian or citizen or science or being uh, honestly engaged uh, in a research enterprise is that any data that's generated about you is also available to you. Um, and so uh, a new project that I'm working on uh, with uh, co-founder Madeline Ball, research scientist from trained at, at Harvard. Um, and then a software engineer, Bo Gunderson, is really is going to explore this and help to assist researchers uh, with implementing this governance in their research study, and then also rewarding them for doing so. And uh, and so, sort of one customer of this of this new program, which launches in a, one to two months, we're in a private alpha right now, um, uh, is on the other cus the other side of the sort of the customer of this of this service is the actual individual who wants to participate in research. And, uh, and helping to give them access to their data and do things with it, um, even if it's just simply to archive and store it and privately. Um, so now this is the real slide that I wanted to get to. And as the end of the day, as just sort of to be provocative and as a citizen science of research governance in many ways, uh, to sort of propose six hypotheses about equal access and things to think about. And you know, one thing, many of these things to me seem really intuitive. Uh, and I, that's why I've chosen them as my hypotheses. And I'm not sure that they've ever been uh, sort of empirically studied or proven. And, and maybe some of you have done this work and can, can come talk to me afterwards and point me to references. Uh, but if not, it should be done. Uh, one question about equal access is, um, you know, will we actually have more, reprodu re, more reproducible science when the individual uh, who is engaged in research study is able to do error correcting or fact checking about what a researcher claims to uh, know about a person. Um, and then two, uh, there's this whole concept that we have about um, research literacy and whether or not citizen scientists are really qualified um, to uh, act in many different ways. And how are we going to improve research literacy unless we you know, open the kimono. And I think equal access is uh, an essential part of that. And also, how can an individual uh, make really good informed sharing decisions without having access to the actual data? Uh, number three, uh, I think re reciprocity is, is powerful. And I would hypothesize that, that in these, these models that there would be much higher recruitment, participation, and retention. Um, four, um, Overall, more data will be shared, although it'll be more varied in, in these models. Uh, number five, uh, that we can demonstrate over and over again that this concept of cognitive surplus is real and that people who are not credentialed actually have meaningful uh, contributions that they can make. And number six, um, and this is one I really should have started with, but my hypothesis is that, that the sort of research enterprise will go the way of medical care and that access to individual level raw research data will be a federally protected right as it is for medical records. Um, and we should all be asking ourselves, uh, why do we not demand more from the research enterprise um, when it comes to the ability to request access and audit uh, the records that are held about us? We do so in, med in medical care, and there's a very long history, decades long history, of advocacy around patient-centered uh, health care and the important role of having access to your medical records about that. And I think the same can be, can be said and will be shown to be said or will be shown in uh, the research enterprise. And um, those are my three slides. Thank you.